Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's event. I'm so glad that you can join us for Evidence-Based Policymaking, A View from the White House Council of Economic Advisors. This event is co-sponsored by the Becker Friedman Institute and the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago, and is part of the Harris series, the Harris Policy Forum, that's designed to bring together academics, researchers, and policymaking, uh, policymakers to address some of our nation's toughest problems. This is a topic that is near and dear to my heart, as I know it is to all of our panelists and so many of you, bringing evidence and analytical thinking to bear on the really challenging trade-offs that policymakers face every day. That's what the University of Chicago is all about, and it's what the Council of Economic Advisors is all about. There's no one better to lead this conversation than Michael Greenstone, who served as CEA Chief Economist to the Barack Obama administration. He's gonna be our moderator and we have a star-studded panel, if I do say so myself. I'm really delighted to get to participate. And I'm even more excited that we have here to introduce us uh, CEA Chair Cece Rouse. She's not able to be here in person, but she has sent her video greetings and I'm really excited to hear what she has to, that, to say. So I will turn it over to the video and then Michael will take it from there. Good evening, and thank you to Kate, the Harris School, and the Becker Friedman Institute for hosting this event. I'm thrilled that the Harris Policy Forum is highlighting the work of the Council of Economic Advisors. The CEA was created in the 1940s to advise the president on economic policy based on data, research, and evidence. It is charged with preparing an annual economic report, the ERP that provides an overview of the nation's economic progress, which the, which the president submits to Congress. In addition, the CEA analyzes economic trends and developments, reviews federal policies and programs to ensure they promote sound economic policy and benefit American workers. Okay, that's the official charge, and we do all that and more. But what really defines the CEA is our love of all things econ geek. At any given moment, we're having in-depth conversations about questions such as what is the right definition of unemployment? And should we really report initial unemployment insurance claims on a weekly basis? Should we use the official poverty line or the supplemental? And what do each of them tell us about the welfare of individuals? To wait or not to wait? Now that is the question. We are often seen as a mini econ department within the White House. Our senior economists come on leave from academic institutions and from other federal agencies. They typically stay a year, work more hours than they thought possible, and return to their home institutions with a flavor for how economics really affects the sausage making process called lawmaking. Because the economists come for one year terms, the CEA is able to cultivate fresh perspectives and innovative methodologies. Perhaps there's some selection bias in terms of who raises their hand to join during any given administration. But we do not ask possible appointments about their party affiliations. Rather, we want good economists who can think creatively, do in-depth work well, and understand that our products are collaborative in nature, not just at the CEA, but across the White House and, and administration. In any given week, CEA staff might work with the Treasury, the National Economic Council, the Domestic Policy Council, the Department of Labor, or the Office of Management and Budget, just to name a handful of our partners. CEA's economists also represent a variety of fields. Since my confirmation, we've staffed the CEA with a well-rounded team that is prepared to address the breadth of complex challenges our nation faces, from clean energy to student loan debt, from the care economy to volatility in financial markets. The CEA is supposed to develop recommendations rooted in the best evidence and an analysis available, and I take that charge seriously. I think it's important to provide the administration with objective economic advice, but as important as it is that the CEA interpret data and research, it's also vital that we utilize the right data. Too often economists focus on averages instead of examining a range of outcomes. As a result, analyses tell us about the middle of the distribution. But as our economy grows more and more unequal, this approach fails to capture the experience of the many Americans left behind, especially people of color. Already my team is engaging outside experts and other federal agencies to modernize data collection in order to better understand the unique challenges 
faced by underserved communities. For example, small sample sizes have limited our ability to adequately capture economic outcomes in tribal communities. Another example, the small numbers of Black and Hispanic households in the survey of consumer finances means that estimates can be noisy year to year. And there are many other data issues we face in trying to ensure we capture a true economic portrait. The COVID-19 pandemic exposed and exacerbated persistent structural inequities in our economy, and far too many people have slipped through our frayed safety net into hardship. We are trying to fulfill President Biden's pledge to build back better and emerge from this crisis as a country with a robust and fair economy. One of my top priorities is to focus on how policies affect everyone in our country so we can build an economy that works for all. As our nation strives to recover from the devastation of the pandemic, it is my honor to lead this unique agency at this pivotal time. Thank you. Let me just try to introduce our uh, panelists, none of whom really need an invitation or, uh, or uh, in, uh, uh, introduction. Uh, Kate Baker is the Dean and Emmett Dedman Professor at the University of Chicago Harris uh, School of Public Policy. She's a CEA member for George W. Bush. Uh, Austin Goolsby is a Robert P. Gwynn Professor of Economics uh, at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business, uh, CEA member uh, and chair for President Barack Obama. Uh, and Tom Phillipson is a Daniel Levin Professor of Public Policy Studies uh, at the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy, CEA member and acting chair uh, for President Donald Trump. All uh, vibrant members of the Chicago community who took time out of their life uh, to contribute to the country. So CC and I did not uh, coordinate this, so there'll be some repetition here, but I thought I wanted to just go back in time before we got into asking questions, having discussion, uh, to where CA came from. Uh, and so if you go back in time, uh, the year was 1945, World War II had been won, uh, but the Great Depression was not far from people's minds. And I think there was a concern that we might slip back into it. Uh, and so President Truman uh, was especially concerned about that. And there was also this increasingly ascendant view associated with John Maynard Keynes that the government had a key role to play in economic stabilization. Uh, so Truman advocated for full employment legislation uh, and the result was the 1946 Employment Act. Uh, many years later, President Nixon CA Chair Herb Stein called CA an accident that didn't need to happen. Uh, according to Stein, the initial employment legislation lacked substance, uh, and that gap was filled by creating new processes and institutions, including the Council of Economic Advisors, the Annual Economic Report of the President, uh, and the Congressional Joint Economic Committee. Since then, CEA, you know, uh, has played a really, 75 years, a critical role in institutionalizing and influencing economic policymaking. As uh, CC said, Chair Rao said, as the in-house research, research organization for the White House. Uh, and taking stock, just stepping back, it's kind of really a unique federal agency. I have a couple bullets here. Uh, it's required to produce a range of statistical and economic reports, perhaps most notably an annual economic report of the president, uh, and although it's required to do that, uh, I, I must say it probably that does reports don't always do so hot uh, in terms of being gold in politics. Uh, I think probably the politicians often prefer to stand in front of bridges and uh, roads and social assistance programs rather than reports. Uh, you know, it has other things that are probably going against it. Uh, it's generally led by academics, who, to put it kindly, or uh, you know, present company exclude it. Uh, not known first and foremost for their efficiency or management skills. Uh, it's also really small. Uh, it has only about 20 economists, a few statisticians, and a handful of research assistants. Uh, while many of the CA economists are recruited from academia, uh, the budget is tight enough that a lot of its professional staff are, uh, I would say, in normal company, you would say stolen, but I think inside the federal government, you would call them detailed. Uh, from other federal agencies in the Fed. Uh, and, you know, if you were to add it all up, the whole thing runs on only about $4 million, uh, which is a drop in the total bucket of the full federal budget of about $4.4 trillion. So despite those kind of headwinds, you might say, I think CA has survived and thrived in ways that might have seemed, you know, completely unlikely in 1946. Uh, it's involved in all major economic decisions, 
Its list of former members and staff reads like a who's who of economists with the roster of alumni, including uh, among those sitting us here. Uh, besides those sitting us here, Arthur Oaken, Marty Feldstein, Joe Stiglitz, Eddie Lazier, uh, and even a few former CEA, chair, CEA chairs who went on to lead the Fed, Arthur Burns, Alan Greenspan, Ben Bernanke, and of course, uh, Janet Yellen, who's now the Secretary of Treasury too. Uh, so the Harris School spends a lot of time training its students on how to do sophisticated benefit cost analyses. But I think this seems one of those very rare cases where the benefits so dramatically exceed the costs uh, that formal analysis isn't required. Uh, and it just it's self-evident that CEA uh, pays for itself many, many times over. Uh, so in this conversation, we're going to try to shed some light on this unique agency that continues to play a central role in economic policymaking after 75 years after its creation. Uh, and for me, it's an incredible pleasure to be able to do so with uh, three colleagues who are part of the agency's alumni network. So let me just start with, uh, I came up with a couple questions. Uh, my high school friends like to joke that when I'm invited to parties, uh, that I should really keep my, I, I have to kind of stay in the back of the room by myself because if I talk too much, it'll become very evident that uh, I'm an economist and it's like introducing a skunk to the picnic. Uh, and so I wondered if each of you could reflect on how did you avoid being the skunk at the picnic uh, in Washington? Uh, and, you know, what characterizes a skunk? You know, a key purpose of CA is to bring rigorous data and evidence to the president and policy meetings to be the voice of facts uh, in meetings that are often dominated by more political voices and considerations. Uh, and so what were your guys' secrets for successfully bringing facts to the table so that you weren't shunted to the back of the room like I so often am uh, with my high school friends? Maybe I'll get started by highlighting the importance of marrying your best evidence with realism about the set of what's possible. Um, academics are not um, known for being willing to shed nuance or to you know, let go of all the footnotes and caveats and wrinkles. It's also hard often to get us off of our first best solution. But if the choices on the table are A, B, and C, Pounding the table and saying it should be Q. Why isn't Q on the table? Let me talk about Q and why it's so good. That's a good way to not get invited back to the next meeting. You need to maybe raise some of the issues involved with A, B, and C, make sure people understand what the limitations are, but then give your best guess about which is best, A, B, or C. Don't um, insist on spending a lot of time talking about things that are just not possible because Lots of things go into decision making besides economics. There's the politics, there's all sorts of, there are the legalities, there are all sorts of things that are outside of our lane. And you do the um, policymakers a disservice by not giving your um, best advice within the bounds of what they're actually considering, which is challenging to know when you should push the envelope and maybe argue for D, A, B, C, but can we put D on the table? But that, that dose of realism, I think, helps your advice be as productive as possible. There's lots more, but I thought I'd get started with that. So Tom or Austin, do you guys have any favorite stories when facts uh, and politics were in conflict and how you tried to stand up for facts? Yeah, I think uh, I could start. Um, I mean, for us, I don't know if it was unique to this president, but it was very president driven the decision making. It wasn't like we were recommending things and he was just nodding off. It was often, very often, sort of a debate uh, in the Oval. And then he liked to have very different views aired. So think of a court system where you have two, you know, defendant and plaintiffs arguing, and therefore there's a competitive production of information. Uh, the consumer, in that case, the jury or judge, makes a call after hearing both biased sides, if you want. It was kind of similar to taking sides, arguing with him. And I think, you know, to be effective, it's very important to be able to take your analytical skills and then translate them into very simple ideas or language, I would say. So in this case, it was always about getting into his head 
how he thought about stuff. So for example, warp speed, I argue about FDA reform long before warp speed and that actually influenced warp speed, but I didn't get anywhere until I kind of made the point that FDA drug development delays are similar to real estate delays with permits. And then it kind of boom, it clicked. And then, it, you know, so it's very important. You can have the facts on your side, but it's very important to translate into a language of the listener. That's always the case. It's not unique to the president but translate into a simple language where you can just get your ideas across in a much simpler way than you're usually used to in academics. Academics is a much higher level of debate, but here is just getting your point across in the simplest possible way you can. And I think that's very important for being effective in these kind of situations. There's kind of a lot going on in the question. Um, I found that on one hand, since the CEA basically works for the president, it makes a huge difference to your life at the CEA if the president wants to hear from the CEA. Um, if the president's not listening and doesn't insist that you be involved in the process, you, the CEA, be involved in the process, then it's the loneliest job in Washington. And if the president does like the chair, the members, wants to insist that the CEA be involved in, in all the process, then it's the funnest job there is because most jobs in Washington are very specialized. You know, the Secretary of Transportation is thinking about transportation all the time. And the CEA is one of the only ones where you're, you're wide ranging, you're thinking about all kinds of stuff. Things are coming in over the transom. Some of them are planned, you know, the budget is every year it's planned, you're involved. Some of them are coming over the transom, you know, the there's COVID, there's a oil spill in the Gulf, there's something. And then they, the, the, somebody high up is like, well, how much is that gonna cost? Or what's gonna be the impact of that? And then you gotta go learn everything uh, that you can about it. That's very exciting. Um, I found, and my, my, you were there when, when, when we were at CEA, I found that some advice that Mike Boskin had told me before we got there, which was the CEA can be really effective um, and have an important role to play, particularly on issues that are not the number one priority issue. So if you want to give your opinion about social security reform, there are a lot of constituents on social security reform and exactly nobody cares what the CEA's opinion is on that. But if it's OIRA and regulation, if it's should there be more spectrum for telecom purposes, how should they design the auctions, you know, th things that are important, but they aren't the number one issue, political issue of the day. I felt like the CEA had a very important role to play because a lot of the agencies don't have the staff, they don't have economists, whether it's the trade rep or other agencies, they would love to have some backup support of, of economists giving them ways to think about it. Um, and then I, I'm sure we'll get into the economic report of the president. There's a lot of focus on that. I was more down on the, on the focus of the reports. And I guess it kind of was summarized for me, every cabinet agency, um, there is a, it's either every other year or, or every 18 months or something, there's this disaster preparedness, like nuclear war. What would happen in a nuclear war? And every cabinet agency has designated somebody to go to this retreat and they go to like Maryland and they contemplate, you know, what would happen in the event of a, of a Holocaust, nuclear Holocaust. And each agency draft a mission statement. And it's like the Defense Department will defend this, what remains of this country from any attackers. And the Secretary of Transportation, Transportation Department will make sure that they're able to get to the food provided by the Agriculture Department. And the CEA had a mission statement that said, we will be ready to prepare studies of any issue that will come up in the Holocaust, and I was like, just kill us now. Just take our space and give two to the agriculture department. You know what I mean? So it's kind of like the 
making of reports regularized like the economic report of the president. I wasn't that big of a, I wasn't that big on that. Um, it Yes, it's part of the job, but I, I thought the benefit of the CEA is if you have the best argument and if you have a relationship with the president or with other agencies, it, it can be, it can be a great benefit. And, and it was, we used to laugh, you know, I'd come home and I'd say, well, I think I saved the American taxpayer $8 billion today. And that's a lot more than my salary. So I, I, I felt good about myself. Can, can um, I pick up on two things Austin said, neither of which is about the bunker. Um, <laughs> one is relationships matter. Again, not the strength of all academics, but you get invited to more meetings when you're like helpful and pleasant and, and good to work with. And the second thing is that the economics toolkit is incredibly powerful. What Austin said about the range of issues you dealt with, to me, that was one of the huge joys of the job was thinking about something I had not thought about in years, if ever, and trying to say something productive about it. And the toolkit we have for putting trade-offs across multiple dimensions into a framework that lets you make a decision is a really powerful universal toolkit. And I think those of us trained in economics start to think of it as common sense, but it's not common sense. There are a lot of really well-trained lawyers or people from other disciplines who just don't think about things that way. So I found that we were always welcome in decision-making about any topic because you could say things like, okay, you're talking about this constituency and the externalities there, and you're talking about the economies of scale in this. And when we put that together, here are the things you need to trade off to make that decision. And it gives people a way to work through what would otherwise be an intractable set of trade-offs and dimensions and constituents and costs and benefits. And that makes us really, really useful. Um, you know, I just want to pick up on uh, one thing Austin said about being opportunistic and looking for where there was a, either an absence of attention or absence of economic analysis. Uh, and I, I don't know if Austin remembers this, but one of the ways that I think people in the political side first started to trust me a little bit was uh, there was this, the president had promised that he was going to close Guantanamo. Uh, and, but then of course, you know, where were you gonna put Guantanamo uh, and where are you gonna put all the political prisoners? Uh, and so the chief of staff would constantly running around trying to find uh, a congressman from a, you know, more and more depressed district. It's like, I've got a great idea. We're gonna build a giant prison in your place and there's gonna be all kinds of economic benefits and da, 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 da. And of course they needed somebody to, you know, he couldn't, he needed some numbers. And I think it like, it just kind of fell down, 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 down. And finally it landed on my desk. And I was like, okay, I will run with this. Uh, and I did, you know, probably the world's best analysis, although would maybe not do so well in uh, one of the classes at the Harris School, but probably the world's best analysis on the local economic benefits of uh, Guantanamo. And that was a way to show, I think, that uh, you could be a team player. And I think there is definitely some, the, uh, the economists have to, earn trust uh, from the political people, partially because they know we're going to go home. And so like our careers don't depend on getting along with them uh, in the end. It, it, totally. And look, the thing is, um, I used to summarize by saying, well, they'd say, how is it? I'd say, well, it turns out politics is very political. <laughs> and the thing, the, the thing by me, there's a deeper meaning to that. Uh, when, when people would say that Woodrow Wilson Woodrow Wilson had some quote that everything he learned about politics, he learned at universities. But that's fundamentally wrong, okay? The universities are not political in the sense that politics is political. They're, they're petty and we argue about things, but fundamentally the following can happen in academics and cannot happen in Washington. If you got so mad at your colleagues, you said, I'm so sick, of all of you, I'm going in my office, I'm gonna shut the door, I'm gonna never speak to any of you again. I'm just gonna teach my class, do my own work, and don't talk to me. You can be a very successful academic. We, we know we have colleagues that, that are like that. Uh, but there is no sense 
in which you would be a, a successful person in Washington. If you were like, you know what? I'm not gonna talk to anyone else. I'm so sick of every political person and all the other cabinet agencies. I'm just gonna do my own thing. That, like, it, it doesn't exist. You know, the, the, um, the primatologists have this phrase that one chimpanzee is no chimpanzees, that fundamentally what makes a chimpanzee's brain what it is, is, is social interaction. And it's kind of politics kind of like that too. So if you're an academic thinking of going to the CEA or to Washington, just, just think, you got to think about that. It's all of building coalitions and talking, making friends and, and, you know, we're doing this thing together and, uh, and it's a different, that's a different thing than academics for sure. It totally takes, it takes, uh, you know, partially academics get rewarded for fighting to death for their unitary idea of being the correct one. Uh, and it's, that is totally not the way it works in Washington. Uh, and it, it certainly took some adjustment. Uh, Tom, did you have something you want to add or should we go to the next question? Uh, no, I think I, I see on the question, your initial question was when there were conflicts between facts and politics and I didn't answer that. So I think I want to take a stab at that, which because I, that was actually something I learned there, which is I always thought it was kind of weird that economists talk about here's the economics and here's the politics because shouldn't economics basically improve welfare, which is what politicians try to do as well. So the question is, was there a clash between uh, politics and quote unquote economics or facts? And, and I, many times, I think the politicians were right and the economists were, were scientists or whatever were wrong. And I think that's something to, to learn from, I think, because the, the, you know, the representatives are out there in their, like in their yard and talking to people, et cetera. And we're very shielded many times from actually the actual people experiencing what, what the policies are doing. So I think there's a great learning lesson in, in taking that more seriously. And I think, you know, COVID was the poster child of that where it was a very one dimensional public health perspective that didn't understand the cost of prevention. And uh, it just, you know, it didn't ring home. And, and when the representatives went home to their states or districts, and that gets got into the, you know, the science versus politics, and, and the politicians were blamed for trying to push FDA too fast, et cetera, which is what the representatives heard from their constituents, et cetera. So it was a lot of conflict between quote unquote politics and science, but I think the politicians or the people you know, yelling at them were the ones who were right. And, and many times economists are faced with the same thing where we think here's the right answer, but then we say politics, it gives us a different answer, which doesn't make sense really, because aren't we supposed to improve the well-being of these people who are yelling? And um, so I think that conflict is kind of something you want to be aware of and think more hard, harder about than simply saying that there's politics involved and therefore economics doesn't apply, which I think is a very mis, misguided view of the world. Okay. Uh, you know, each of you were there uh, when there were very particular crises or uh, important moments uh, for the country. And I wanted to see if you guys uh, could talk about this. Although, sorry, I should have said this from the start. Uh, if you have a question, put it in the Q&A box and uh, there will be time at the end. So sorry about that. But just, so I wanted to talk for a minute or two about CA uh, role in crises. Uh, and I guess it's, Tom, you've talked about this. Maybe you have something different you want to add, but like the, it's, you know, top of mind, you were there and when the COVID-19 pandemic set off, been an incredible challenge for the country. And as you were just suggesting, it involves all kinds of trade-offs between health and economic well-being. Uh, how did you advise President Trump given those to navigate those seemingly uh, opposite pressures, opposing pressures, right? Yeah, so I think, I mean, I've done research in that area, it turned out. So I was kind of lucky in that way, I think, um, having 
you know, spend some time thinking about it before I got there. But there were two aspects of that research which I kind of guided how I advised things and I think was pretty impactful both on him and, and the vice president running the task force. And uh, one is that, you know, when you have a disease, it's kind of like a tax and you, you can avoid that disease just like you avoid a tax. It's a, sort of an excess burden of the disease. And then there's the disease itself or the tax revenue that is the total cost of that disease. And for COVID, the biggest part of the biggest harm of the disease was not the disease itself. It was the cost of prevention of, of your foregone economic activity that took place, which Casey Mulligan and others have measured dominated the, any kind of value of life or value of morbidity and that costs involved. So that came in very central in my thinking and led to my main sort of uh, advice, which I pushed March, 2020 already, <clears throat> which was really to kind of, uh, there was two sides to this epidemic. One was, was the high risk. So, you know, 85% of mortality was in the plus 65 population. And those were inactive on the supply side of the economy, mostly retired folks. And uh, for the rest of the population, it was a very low risk disease, which CA discovered way ahead of CDC and other agencies. Uh, so, and they were economically active on the supply side. So there was sort of a twofold strategy, which I think is kind of where most countries ended up. And we advised him early on that, which was try to separate the high risk or high prevention for the high risk or inactive in the economy. And then to try to get the low risk as active as, as possible in, in, in the economy. And I think that kind of twofolded thing came, you know, we see that for the vaccine implementation, obviously we went after the old people first in, in, that, in that prevention effort, but you can think of economic you know, reduction in economic activity is another form of prevention effort that took place. Um, and it, it should have been focused more on sort of isolating the old and keeping the young active. And I, I think the president was very influenced by that. The second thing that actually drove a lot of stuff was that in this excess burden or cost of prevention, driving the total cost more than the disease, it's not uncommon and it's true for COVID too, to, for innovation to be the least costly method of prevention. So, you know, for HIV, we had drugs that prevented the impact of the disease. And that's much easier to change than behavior. Same with obesity. We have, you know, you know, surgery that has been successful as opposed to behavioral change. And, you know, eating and, and, and reproduction are probably the most programmed behaviors humans have. Uh, so it's hard to change those, but innovation, basically medical innovation changed them. So that drove a lot of attention on warp speed to try to get the vaccines as soon as possible was sort of a goal almost starting in January, February, almost came emerged as, as a key aspect of our strategy. And I think the president was very successful in, in uh, implementing that. And we were leaning heavily on FDA uh, to try to, uh, try to have uh, pushed them to a much faster outcome than otherwise uh, would have taken place. So I think, I think CA was very, very impactful in those discussions. And I think it, it, it paid off in terms of good policies. Great. Uh, well, we might as well stick with health. Uh, Kate, during your time at the CA, there was an effort to implement consumer directed health insurance options, uh, as well as uh, the role of the Medicare Part D drug coverage, which uh, was a very substantial change. How did you advise uh, the Bush administration on the health system reform? And what did you think worked well? What didn't work as well? And you know, what should they have really listened to from you that they didn't? Well, uh, one thing that we're, that, that came to fruition that you know millions of senior citizens are using every day is the Medicare Part D drug benefit. And until, 2005, Medicare didn't cover drugs, even though it, you know, had been around for 
50 plus years. And it was in part because when Medicare was first created, prescription drugs weren't a very important part of healthcare. They weren't very expensive. There wasn't all that much you could do for people. And so it just wasn't a high priority. Well, of course, prescription drugs are really important to people's health now and access to affordable drugs is vital, but it took Medicare an awfully long time to bake that in. And there was a lot of thinking that went in to designing a benefit that would um, make sure that it was affordable to individuals, but at the same time offered some flexibility in insurance design and incentive for the introduction of new drugs, invention, development, and introduction of new drugs going forward. So the Medicare Part D benefit is very complicated in lots of ways, hopefully not to individual patients once they're enrolled, but it's got a lot of machinery in there to accomplish a lot of different goals. And one thing that um, became clear during the debate is that people felt as though everyone needed to have a benefit of being enrolled in this right away. So there's some first dollar coverage for beneficiaries in the Medicare Part D benefit. The first drugs you buy are like 100% covered by Medicare for the most part. That's a funny way to design an insurance plan. When you think about it, insurance is for the expensive stuff, not for the low cost initial stuff, but it provided a way to make sure that everybody felt um, a benefit of being enrolled and also that you drew everybody into the system right away because risk pooling is really important. There's some aspects of it that I think worked really well and some aspects that, you know, in retrospect, you think that seems like a law written by a big committee. And it, there are a lot of lurchy parts that I think people would like to um, tweak going forward. And also the prescription drug landscape has changed substantially. So it ended up being having a substantially lower cost to taxpayers and enrollees than originally forecast by the CBO, in part because the competition between plans did work as expected, but then beneficiaries ended up with higher out-of-pocket costs for really expensive things than I think had been hoped. And so there have been efforts since then to try to fill the donut hole and provide more catastrophic coverage for people in the very high end of the spending distribution. So I think it's a work in progress, but one that clearly brought a much needed benefit to all uh, seniors who were enrolled in Medicare. There was also an effort to um, augment uh, high deductible health plans and health savings accounts with the idea that right now, uh, the health care that you buy through an employer sponsored plan is tax favored. The employer doesn't pay taxes on it. Individuals don't pay taxes on it. And all of that drives us to have more expensive benefits and lower cost sharing through employer plans than would be either efficient or equitable. It's really unfair for people who don't have access to employer plans at all, or people who had a lot of out-of-pocket expenses that were not tax preferred. So the idea was to level the playing field, sort of make sure that people who had high deductible plans could pay for the out-of-pocket care with pre-tax dollars through a health savings account. Now, I think that that also met with mixed success. It was never implemented as uh, envisioned in the president's plan. It, we have hints of it today, but there's been movements towards other mechanisms. But one of the challenges is that people don't consume healthcare like the perfectly farsighted rational agents that economists uh, might envision. And, and that's been known for a long time and there, there was an effort to design accordingly, but having more nuanced cost sharing is a new set of tools that I think might be um, a way to get all of the advantages of greater consumer direction of healthcare resources, patient direction of healthcare resources without making um, care that's of really high health benefit unaffordable for anyone. So I think the down payment on patient-centered health care is going to be an important complement to the provider side reforms that we need in paying better, uh, paying for value instead of volume. I think there's been progress since then, but I thought it was a really valiant effort to help level the playing field for people who didn't have the advantage of a fancy job with a really expensive employer-sponsored health insurance plan and no cost sharing. Excellent. Uh, Austin, you were a member and then a chair. 
uh, in the midst and aftermath of the Great Recession, uh, I remember the feeling of uh, we don't fully know what's going on. Uh, what was that like? Uh, what stands out in your mind? Uh, what advice are you most proud of for giving to President Obama? And would you like to have any advice? Would you like to be able to take any of it back? I mean, it was horrible. It was a horrible moment. It was like really, really stressful. And, you know, I remember us not, you know, eating, eating Tic Tacs for dinner kind of thing and, and sleeping under the table. Um, we got a colleague here at Chicago's economic historian and he kept saying, Obama keeps saying that his number one priority was at the end of the campaign in the transition. He keeps saying his number one priority is prevent the Great Depression, now the next Great Depression. I say that is his first priority. And he said, well, it's too late. It's gonna, he should be saying he has a plan to get us out of the depression because it's not, it's inevitable that we're gonna have a depression. So I kind of think that was the context of the of the work we were doing. Um, at a moment like that, the good news is everybody wants to hear from the CEA, <laughs> like what did the economists think? And the bad news is uh, you don't, I mean, you, you, you have ideas, but events like that don't happen that frequently. So, so you, you, you got opinions, but it's kind of like Tom said, you know, the, ultimately the president's elected, he's the one who's got to decide um, w w what they're going to do. And everybody can have an opinion of, oh, you should just uh, follow the following silver bullet strategy, which will solve all the problems. In your heart of hearts, you know that's not true. And the person whose name's on the masthead is the one who's going to get in trouble if, if everything goes wrong, and that's, that's the president. So I found somewhat frustrating, but also oddly um, maybe interesting as an academic to observe that ultimately there is kind of a Washington way of solving problems, which is there's a battle of worldviews and the Washington way is, well, we'll never resolve which of these is correct. So let's do a third of each one. Um, and, and, and everybody gets a third of what they want. We kind of cut a package deal. And for things where that's the correct answer, um, it will work. And for things where that's not the correct answer, it leads to further problems. So it's why ultimately in the long run, I'm kind of optimistic about that the country will deal, will, will ma manage its way through the long run fiscal challenges. Because in a way, the correct answer is, well, let's cut some of this and cut some of that, and raise some of these taxes, raise some of those, we'll do to make a big pack. And my summary in the, of the stimulus was that there was a whole argument through the transition that broke out, which was fundamentally about worldviews. What is the nature of this downturn and what will be the nature of the recovery? And there was a group saying, it's gonna be a V-shaped recovery. So don't do anything that will take more than two years because by the time it comes online, it will just be inflationary. And there was a second group saying, no, no, it's a financial crisis. It's gonna, it's gonna go for a long time. So we should put it all in infrastructure and a 10 year package. And then there was a third group of political people who were like, doesn't matter what it is, we need to get some votes. So let's just make it all tax cuts because at least the Republicans will vote for that. And even if you say that's not the best, so then back and forth, back and forth. And so in the end they agreed, well, let's do a third of each. So if you go look at it, the stimulus was basically a third tax cuts, a third short run stuff and a third long run stuff. Um, and once you see how that plays out in the decision-making, it's okay. Your job at the CA, you're not the decision maker. You're not elected. You're just a person from a university who's there working for two years, giving the best advice you can give. You're the, you're not, I, I used to say at that time, you know, to anybody who ever watched NASCAR, you're not Dale Jr. Okay. You're the, you're the people who jump over the wall and they run out 
with the tire, they get the tires off and they put it in, you put gas in the tank, you get them back out. And that's really important. If they could do that in 13 seconds, that can be the difference between winning the race and coming in 20th, but you're not driving the car. Um, and so in the crisis, I felt best about advice that I gave that was of that form. It was like, look, I'm not telling you what to, what to order. I'm showing you, here's a menu. Here's what the prices are. Here's the complications if you go with, with A versus B. Um, and that was true in the discussion of autos. That was true in the discussion of the auto rescue. That was true in the discussion of the stimulus. It was true in the, the many internal battles of the how should we re-regulate the, the financial system. And it was definitely true in healthcare, though I wasn't, that wasn't my main, um, that wasn't my main thing. But the, the same thing was true, is all, all you can do is give the best advice you can give. The CA is not in charge of anything, so you can't bigfoot anybody or roll over them. All you can do is, is make your arguments. And if the president listens, then other people will listen. And if the president's not interested, then other people are not going to be interested. Excellent. Um, one thing I want to talk about, it was certainly on my mind when I was there, uh, is it's a little bit strange as an academic to have a boss. Uh, and that took a little getting used to, and like, uh, you know, the president was the boss in one way or another, as all of you have been indicating, uh, and you're working for him, and that puts some boundaries on things sometimes, and I wonder how you guys, did you guys ever think about that? Did you ever think about what that would mean for your reputation when you went back to academia? Uh, you know, I often felt like, you know, we're just visiting Washington land uh, and they know that and we know that and we have to go back to our old world and they know that. Uh, and, you know, I, I found that somewhat complicated to navigate at times. I don't know. I, I didn't get that feeling. I think maybe because Trump was a business guy, he was more kind of in tune with the economists than, you know, if you've been a governor or, or something like that, I don't know. But it, it was it was very, I felt CEA or the econ team in general, CEA and NEC, OMB, uh, you know, were very close and very impactful. And I didn't think it, it didn't get a lot of the White House was kind of economically geared because the president was economically geared in some sense. So I didn't get the feeling that we were kind of outsiders as much. Uh, you know, I think the main drawback from an academic point of view is that I think Catherine pointed to that, which is academics are not used to working in teams. I think Austin also mentioned that. But, and, you know, especially if you come from Chicago where you used to yell at each other in seminars, it's a little bit more polite today than it was 20 years ago. But, you know, you come from that environment and if that's your mindset in a meeting in the Roosevelt room, that's not very productive, right? And my personality is certainly not the best or easiest to get along with. And that's kind of got in the way many times, you know, that kind of mindset that you wanted to make yourself uh, or try to convince people of your side all the time. And I think that was the biggest, I wasn't, I get, I didn't get the feeling that we were on loan and therefore people didn't take it seriously. But I did think that we had a handicap in not being sort of working in groups in our regular environment as opposed to individuals. And that, that is a big difference. And I think Austin hit that nail on the head. Of, you know, that's a big difference between being in academics versus being in a team setting like that. I ran a company before I came to the White House. So I was kind of a little bit trained more so than I was when I only did academics, but still it was, that was, I think the major issue with being an academic in the room. I also think that as an academic, you entirely drive your research agenda. You know, that's the, the, your point about not having a boss is like your next research paper is entirely up to you. Whereas at CEA, I 
felt like we were very reactive to the president's agenda. You didn't know what was coming over the transom. If the president was all about immigration, you were all about immigration. And that forces you to be reactive to the topic, to the time frame. Like if there's going to be a big speech on topic X on Friday, your comments on that speech are due on Thursday. Like there's no flexibility there. And if you think the most important thing is healthcare, but no one else does, you're not working on healthcare the whole time you're there. So it, that's that requires a different mindset and you have to kind of go with it. I remember when I came back to academia after two years at CEA, I would go into my office and I would sit down and I would wait for something to happen. And it turns out that in academia, nothing ever happens. Like you sit there, the phone never rings. You suddenly, it took me, you know, several weeks to get into the mindset of like having to make my own agenda every day instead of frantically keeping up with the deluge of things that came in. But I also think there's an advantage to being a short termer because for two years is not that short term, but in Washington, it kind of is. I didn't care. I wasn't thinking about my next job. I wasn't thinking about positioning myself with others to move up in my agency, to move to a different agency. I only cared about doing my existing job as well as I possibly could. And there's a certain freedom in that. Nobody's worried about competing with you for the undersecretary position or competing with you for the next you know, promotion in the agency. So you can just be the honest broker, straight shooter. You're only in it for the best advice. And I think everybody's trying to do that, but being freed of your own career concerns gives you a little bit of freedom and flexibility. It requires you to adjust really quickly to the new social norms, the new modes of working in groups and being part of this whole machinery of Washington politics process. You don't have much time to get up to speed in that before you're chewed up and left by the roadside if you don't adapt. But if you can make that adaptation, you can maneuver pretty freely. And people cut you some latitude, like you're a toddler who doesn't know any better. Like you show up in a meeting you weren't supposed to be in and people just let you stay. You know, so I thought, I thought it was actually to our advantage to be outside of that beltway mentality a lot of the time. I thought the biggest difference from academics to government was actually, I mean, yeah, yes, it was political and teams, but day-to-day -day basis in Washington, the, the time pressure is this high and the standard of evidence is kind of like this low. And in academics, it's like totally the reverse. So there's an incredible standard of evidence of you have you must prove that every possible contingent alternative explanation is not correct but you have forever to do that and like kate said in washington if the president's giving a speech on housing finance reform on friday then you have to have whatever your input is by thursday maybe by wednesday and so it means if you're going to reach out to academics, and this is a lesson to if any of you are academics and you're getting called from the CEA, answer the phone call. I would call people up and I'd be like, I need to talk to you about your paper. Nothing. Well, it's fine. We're going to just have to go without that. A week later, the person calls, oh, did you want to talk about housing finance? Like, dude, that was, a, that was, that was like a last millennium. You know, so that... Um, that time pressure, and it's a sign that Kate is as well adjusted as she is, that it's just, she said it took her weeks to get used to that. I've been out 10 years, I still have that problem of like, I'm looking I'm like, what, no one cares what we're doing, why, what, what are we doing, what, no one calls, no one's paying attention. Um, you don't have that existential problem in DC. Um, and that's for, better and for worse. You know what I mean? So coming back, it's a totally different time scale. I would like to think that anybody who went to work at the CEA at any level, usually it does influence what they find interesting and what they want to work on. And it pulls them toward what's important. Um, and you, you do suffer a little bit that you go to the seminar and you 
your patience for like, we're going to argue about what level of clustering should the standard errors be? And it, it, it goes down. You're just like, oh my God, I cannot deal with this uh, argument. But you also have a bigger, you have a bigger think view of if somebody gives a paper, you can say, oh, this would be whatever I got. I wish we'd had that paper when we were making whatever decision. Um, and so I think it's mostly for good, but you know, it's, it comes with some drawbacks. I do think it's, uh, so first of all, I'm gonna assume Austin that you are not critiquing my uh, economic analysis of moving Guantanamo to the US. <laughs> uh, but I do think it's interesting we have mutually assured destruction, so I'm not going to criticize anything you wrote. Yeah. <laughs> um, I do think it's interesting. I think for the people who stay for one year, this isn't true, but for people who stay the more one more than one year, I think if you look at their research trajectory, the types of questions they ask or the amount of research they're producing, you can totally see a trend break in it afterwards. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it's... Uh, it is a, it's noteworthy. And actually that was something I thought about a lot when I was there, uh, which is, is this something I really want to do for the rest of my life? Or do I want this to change my life and how to balance that? Um, okay, we're almost to the questions. Uh, we just had uh, Chair Rouse, CC, talk a few minutes ago. Uh, we're in an interesting economic place right now. Uh, this is a lightning round. There's gonna be two lightning round questions. You do not get a long chance for a long answer here. Uh, if you could give, you know, maximum three sentence piece of advice uh, to her or to the country, what are the things we should be focusing on economically? I guess Baker begins with a B. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't lose your sense of the alphabet in Washington. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Clearly, Recovering from COVID is first, second, and third jobs. And that's about help, of course, but it's also about the economic consequences, as Tomas mentioned, which are wildly disparately felt along with the health consequences. So thinking about how to be smart in recovery so that we can preserve health in a way that's compatible with as much economic activity as possible it's hard to imagine focusing on something other than that for a while. Uh, I guess G is next. You know, uh, I, I wrote academic research about the question of how much of the economic slowdown came from policy lockdown decisions versus from fear of, of people not wanting to catch the virus. And, and I, in the process of that coined my view, which was that the number one rule of virus economics is you want the economy to recover, you gotta get control of the spread of the virus. Um, and I still think that's true, but I kind of think we're looking at the back end of this. Um, and so I thought it was a little inspired of Joe Biden to pick CeCe Rouse because coming out of crises, I think all these issues of the workforce, which CC is a world expert on, are going to become front and center absolutely important. The fact that it was the first downturn that we've had where the demand for enrollment in school went down, not up, uh, you know, partly because schools were closed, partly because people didn't have the money, is gonna live, we're gonna live with that for a while. Um, I think the, the, fact that this was so unequal and hit low skilled occupations, which tend to have to be done in a specific place and often face to face with the customer and high end occupations could be done from home because they're in the knowledge economy. I think that we will live with that for some time. And so all of these, plus the issue of parents whose kids can't go to school and there is no daycare dropping out of the labor force because they simply cannot work if, they, if they're in that circumstance. All three of those, I think, are going to become first order important over the next 12 to 24 months. And, and so I hope they are thinking about that. 
So uh, my advice, I probably couldn't have a different, more different worldview of what's going on in the White House as being good policy uh, than most people. But uh, there's a statue that created CA that says that the CA is responsible to promote free enterprise. Actually, it's in the statute. And that's one of the reasons we wrote the socialism report, which was very criticized, but I think foreshadowed what's going on now. Uh, but I think that's something that CA should think more about in terms of uh, how much government control is currently attempted to take place of the economy relative to free enterprise. And, and if you follow the statute, maybe, maybe it's worth thinking about that more than and the CA being the room, the, maybe the adult in the room even in, in those conversations. That would be my hope. I don't think that's an advice or something that would be followed, but that would be my hope. Great. Uh, okay, we have a series of questions. One I'm gonna kind of mash up uh, with a question that I had as well. Uh, in the Clinton administration, they established something called the National Economic Council. Uh, which it's a White House office designed to coordinate economic policy. It's separate uh, from the CA. Uh, I didn't probably know it before I went to Washington. I didn't really understand the difference between CA and NEC. Uh, and I grew an appreciation for the importance of org charts and clear lines of authority. Uh, and I wondered if all of you could talk about uh, how does it work to have the two organizations that are somewhat distinct, but have similar roles and overlapping agendas. Uh, look, uh, it, it's something that I thought a fair amount about at that moment. And I've talked to people uh, since, and I'd be interested to hear what, what uh, Kate and Tom think. I think the fact that there isn't an entity that coordinates policy and is kind of explicitly political. That's not that's not bad. And if the CEA thinks that that's what they were doing before the NEC was created, they're kind of deluding themselves. There always was a process, the political process overseeing th that advice. Um, that said, there have been various models of what the NEC chair does and who the staff are that they hire at the NEC. Some of which, like in the case of Larry Summers or Larry Lindsay or Laura Tyson, they're PhD economists. In, in the Summers case, he was hiring PhD economists and, and sometimes professors to come in and be advisors, you know, Jeremy Stein, David Sharfstein, to come advise on the financial crisis, there it's bleeding together, and and I and I do think it's kind of like, well, what is the CEA if the NEC is full of academic economists and PhDs who are going to give economic advice on all the various things? I think that, that can lead to tension. It does seem also like um, the the decision which at first seems kind of minor, but I don't think is minor, that at various administrations sometimes move the CEA to cabinet rank and sometimes move them out. So in Obama, they explicitly moved the CEA after the Bush years, they moved it up to be a cabinet agency. And in Washington, things like that do matter. It, are, whether the other cabinet secretaries feel like they need to listen to what the CEA is saying is influenced by, well, where are you in the hierarchy and what does the president think? Um, it made me nervous that the Trump administration downgraded it and set up alternative councils like the Peter Navarro thing. I, I forget what the name of it was. If the perception becomes, well, the president's listening to other economists besides the CEA for economic advice, I do think that can that is a problem. Uh, for CEA. And sometimes that does happen with NEC. But overall, I kind of think somebody's got to run the process and be a little more political than the CEA is comfortable being. And so it, a lot of that is, is natural to, to be at the NEC. 
Yeah, I think I think I echo that. I mean, we didn't have the PhD economists like the Summers or whatever running NEC with, you know, we had Gary Cohn and Larry Kudlow. And it was a clear division of comparative advantage of, you know, networking the hill and organizing the process, which was NEC. And then CA came in more as economic experts, and that was recognized by NEC, et cetera. I think the more we, we, we had conflicts more with the departments than within the White House, I think. So Commerce or Treasury or whatever would many times disagree with CEA on various issues. And it was more kind of those tensions that arose in our case. But I think that's partly due to that. There wasn't PhD economist in the, in, in the NEC at our, in our administrations. Kate, what was it like in the Bush administration? You know, I think the way uh, Austin described the division of labor made good sense. You know, having the, the NEC served as the honest broker coordinating input from all of the relevant stakeholders from CEA and Treasury and HHS. And there was sort of a regularized process where feedback on specific policies or positions would come in from those sources and get digested and aggregated by NEC. And that it, it really had to be an honest broker role and not a thumb on the scale. And when I was there, it felt like that worked well. Again, going back to the point that individual people matter and personalities matter. Um, when I started at CEA, Ben Bernanke was the chair. He quickly moved over to the Fed. We had a, a period where Matt Slaughter and I were the two members and there was no chair and we muddled through. And then Eddie Lazier came in as chair. He was a wonderful chair. He's a wonderful man. We all lost him recently and he is a, beloved by all of us who knew him. He was very close with the president. He was very close with the head of the uh, NEC, who was Al Hubbard. Um, I was as well. And so because of those relationships, I honestly never felt that CEA was treated not as cabinet rank. We were in every meeting, in the senior leadership morning huddles, the sort of regularized process. But that was because everybody um, respected and wanted to incorporate CEA's point of view. So I, I do think having the NEC not supplant that role is really important. Um, okay, we're gonna turn this into a uh, lightning question. We have four minutes left. Uh, this is from Rick Kolsky. What economic theory you that you believed in before your time at CA did you change, uh, your belief change, based uh, on your experiences? That's a tough one. I, I mean, we obviously got heavily involved with trade and we were fighting a lot with Navarro. That was no secret, uh, but and this has been recognized in economic literature before Trump that, you know, the domestic costs of free trade, et cetera. But those tensions, I think, came up uh, more vividly in the Trump administration, I think, and uh, partly because of his policy agenda. But, you know, if, if, you, if you would ask many people outside a small literature that sort of documented the, the issues with, lower cost labor in other countries. Uh, you know, those issues were uh, not as, I mean, I, you have to think about them in a but different context, I would say, having worked at, at the White House. Okay. I guess I would say it's kind of, it didn't change my view of economic, uh, of economics, really, uh, that something was wrong. But I'll give you an example of the kind of thing. It, it made me much more skeptical of pure economic theory designed uh, incentives. We, there, there was a mortgage assistance trying to prevent foreclosure. And it was well designed in terms of the incentives. It was going to give incentives to banks to reduce the interest rate, to make it affordable. And 
we were going to count on people didn't want to give up their homes if they're living in their homes. And we, it didn't cross our mind that the following would happen. It was called the dual tracking problem. The bank agrees to write down the mortgage, not to write down the mortgage, to write down the monthly payment without writing down the principal of the mortgage. So you only have to pay, let's say, half your payment. The other half of the bank is somehow not told that. So the people pay one half of their payment for six months, and then that half of the bank moves to foreclose on them for not having made their payments. And it, it was just totally inconceivable. The, the, the incentives were perfectly aligned and the CEOs of the banks had agreed to it. It's just that these practical considerations of execution of policies um, is really, really so much more important than what the economic theory says. And, and that comes out at you at every level of the government. <laughs> You're like, you better think before you adopt some silver bullet, advocate, advocate a silver bullet solution, you better think through in practical terms how it be executed. Yeah, I think um, my answer picks up on two of Austin's themes. One is it gave me a heightened appreciation for the importance of regulation and implementation that we tend to write out models that abstract from a lot of the detail and you need to for tractability, but it turns out that matters a lot and things that seem like fantastic ideas just aren't practical or things that you thought would work one way get implemented in a slightly different way that completely changes the incentives. And so I have a heightened appreciation for that. At the same time that um, as Austin was saying, it just lowered my interest in or tolerance for a lot of the second and third order conditions where we spend so much of our time in academic research. And those things are important on one level and they really do help us advance nuanced, sophisticated understanding of things. But sometimes I think we're just missing a lot of the big picture questions for getting enamored of the wrinkle after wrinkle upon wrinkle of the thing that we've been talking about for 30 years. So it, it did change my sense of what's exciting and important in research world and the importance of the nuance in real world implementation. Okay, we're at time, but I was desperate to get this question in. So you all only get uh, one sentence. Uh, but I, before I do that, I will just add, I left Washington with a much greater appreciation of distributional issues than I had probably before. I think I was, much I hadn't realized how important distributional issues were relative to efficiency, uh, and that, that that's something I took away from. But here's the question: uh, only one sentence. Uh, name your favorite number, graph, something like that that you produced or were involved in producing that you thought was impactful. That the Harris School is training all the participants on this Zoom call to produce. Um, I mean, one that comes to mind, but ultimately it was overruled, but I still like that we made it. it. In the question of the auto rescue, the issue was if you try to save General Motors and Chrysler, will that endanger General Motors, Chrysler, and Ford? And the question of if Chrysler went under, would the people who would otherwise have bought Chrysler's, what cars would they buy? So if that, if a Chrysler buyer is just going to turn and go buy a General Motors truck instead of a Chrysler truck, you know, Dodge Ram, then the net impact would not actually be that big on jobs. And we produced what was effectively an IO demand analysis in a little chart that was easy to understand and we could show to people who they don't know, they've never heard of, of Barry Levinson and Pecos, you know, or what, what, what a cross price elasticity is, but it basically showed, look, here, here's why we think uh, what, what the substitution would be. That was a pretty good chart. That was fun. Uh, Kate, you're next on my screen. I think we produced a really nice graphic of the relative cost of healthcare for people in different insurance buckets 
and the distributional consequences of change of leveling up or leveling down the price of healthcare based on what type of people were in each of those buckets. And it was a really nice way to illustrate that the um, tax favoring of employer-sponsored health insurance was both inequitable and inefficient. And usually in economics, you're trading off those two. And this was a nice illustration of a case where you could achieve both with one policy. And that was one sentence with an artfully placed semicolon. Okay, let me just say, Tom, I think you know how much I admire both Austin and Kate, but they have both failed miserably on the one sentence rule. Uh, no, uh, I have to disagree with our Dean. Uh, Tom, I want you to be a leader here and show us the one sentence version. So I produce a graph when some people in the White House wanted to get rid of the salt a cap deduction so you can, can't Take away. You have to currently you have to pay on top of your federal taxes, your local and state. At least. Period about the land, Tom. Yeah, I know. Ten grand. So there was this graph there that showed how much the locales basically live off other states. And CA was alone in arguing it, and we won the president over, and, and that argument died in oval in a quiet death, which was very useful. Terrific. Okay, uh, this was a spectacular conversation only because of the three people who participated. Uh, and I want to uh, ask you all to join me in thanking them. I am slowly learning how to do the Zoom clap thing, but I'll just do this instead. Uh, thank you all very much. Uh, and uh, Kate, any final words? Thank you for hosting and thank you all for attending. There's no panel if you guys don't listen. So thank you all for participating for your great questions and hopefully we'll get to do this in person sometime soon.